Hello AP Bio students. Today we're going to go through chapter 4. We're talking about carbon and different functional groups, so how we end up with molecular diversity. The first thing you need to know is if we're going to talk about carbon, we're really talking about organic chemistry, which is just simply the study of carbon compounds. This study first started to affect biology in about 1953. Stanley Miller took different organic compounds um, and made them relevant to biology through evolution by a experiment to demonstrate Earth's primitive conditions. He used a lab simulation and used very basic materials like water, hydrogen, ammonia, and methane, and then he simulated lightning hitting it. And he found out that you could make various organic compounds from that simple mixture. This fed into biology, so suddenly organic chemistry became very relevant to the study of biology. We now know that all of that versatility and the creation of those compounds come from carbon being such a versatile element. It forms four covalent bonds, it's tetrahedral, and it bonds easily to itself. Carbon has a valence of four, um, that means it has four empty spots in its shell of eight. Each carbon provides a four-directional branch for others to bond to, or we say it has tetravalence. Okay? This ability gives it um, a way to bond with a large amount of other compounds and molecules, and so we can make very large molecules. Here are the other listing of the major elements of an organic molecules, which are car carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. And you can see all of them have um, their valences shown below. One special group we want to pay attention to is hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons all by themselves are not actually in living things. Hydrocarbons are what make up things like petroleum and fats, so its uh, parts are involved in a living thing, but there is no hydrocarbon molecule inside a living organism. Um, many cells have large regions of hydrocarbons, um, and again, this goes back to our evolutionary history. And one of the good things is by having these hydrocarbons, what they give you is a hydrophobic region, okay, because they're nonpolar um, bonds. And the one thing is when you split these hydrocarbons apart, you release huge amounts of energy. That is why fat is such a great energy source. The next thing we want to talk about are isomers. Isomers are compounds with the same formula but different structures. So the first thing you need to be able to do is identify if something is an isomer or not. Remember, isomers contain the same number of atoms of each element, but they're arranged differently. There are three types of isomers, structural, geometric, and entomers. So if I look at these, this is my first type of structural entomer. They have a completely different covalent arrangement. But if I were to count, remember, this area right here is where your carbons are. They're just not shown. I can see that they have the same amount of carbons, the same amount of hydrogens, and the same amount of oxygens. But they are arranged in a different configuration. Geometric isomers um, have the same partnerships, but again, their spatial arrangement is different. And that a cis okay, isomer is where that functional group will be on the same side, and then a trans isomer is where now the functional groups are moved to opposite sides. This, haps, this happens typically because of a double bond. So you want to look for that double bond present. That's a good indicator of a geometric isomer. The last type of isomer we want to talk about is an entomer. These are mirror images, and they usually involve an asymmetric carbon. So they involve one carbon that's bonded to four different things. So again, there's your signature you're looking for. So one carbon with four different functional groups attached to it.
And now I can look at the differences in examples right here. I have structural isomers where I can see the rearrangement, um, but they are not an exchange of sides. Okay? A geometric isomer, I'm looking for that double bond, and I'm looking for the functional groups to be on the same side or opposite sides. And entomers, I'm looking for one asymmetrical carbon with four different functional groups attached. Again, those are my signatures I'm looking for to help identify isomers. Now, organisms are very sensitive to changes in molecular structure. We all know form dictates function. So one of the things that we can give as an example is L-DOPA is an example of a drug that's very effective in the use against Parkinson's disease, but D-DOPA, its entomer, is ineffective and actually has no treatment. So they have to be careful when they're making these compounds that they make the right entomer. Another that had a huge, powerful difference, okay, the L-DOPA was effective, the D-DOPA had no treatment, but in this case, the thal thalidomide was a drug that was used during pregnancy. It was used in the 1950s and 1960s to help reduce morning sickness. Um, one entomer is an effective drug, and the other causes massive birth defects. And the images below are examples of the birth defects that were present in the children of women who had the wrong entomer of thaldehyde. The next thing we're going to talk about, and this is a straight memorization item, guys. You're going to have to make yourself some flashcards, which we're going to do in class tomorrow, is functional groups. These are groups of atoms that are going to attach to the carbon skeleton. These groups have very consistent properties, and they give certain properties to the molecules they attach to. Just how important are these different functional groups? Well, if you take a look at these two hormones okay, that occur in pretty much every vertebrate's body, okay, we have estradiol, or estrogen, and testosterone. These only differ in functional groups. The molecule is basically the same. It has two different functional groups, and those two different functional groups uh, cause a huge influence on the anatomy and physiology in males and females. So we're talking about huge anatomy changes, okay, huge development changes that occur in male and female species based on two functional groups. What do you need to focus on as we go through this? You need to know the structure, you need to know the properties, and you need to know examples of molecules. Our first group is hydroxyl. What you're looking for is an OH. It can also be written as an HO. They're called an alcohol, okay, and they're polar. And they're very good at forming hydrogen bonds, and they can help dissolve molecules. Why would you want to dissolve molecules? Well, if you've got to take things apart and put them back together, you want to have that ability to rip apart a hydrogen bond. The next group is a carbonyl group. There are two different breakdowns of carbonyls. There's ketones, where that double bond will occur within a carbon skeleton. And the aldehyde is where it's at the end of the skeleton, okay, the end of the carbon range. So take a look. You've got a ketone where it's in the middle of the carbons and an aldehyde where it's at the end of the carbons. You will need to know the difference. Again, these are two things that are found in sugars, okay, and they give your uh, aldehydes and ketones and those allow you to process sugars quickly. So again, your aldehyde is at the end of a carbon skeleton and your ketone is in the middle. The next group is a carboxyl, which is a carbon double bonded to an oxygen with an hydroxyl. It has acidic properties, okay, and 
These acidic properties are because it's very polar. Okay, it gives us things like acetic acid, which we know as vitamin C, okay, um, and vinegar. Carboxylic acids are, again, a weak acid, and they form many. Amino, or amines, are a nitrogen bonded to hydrogens, and these act as a base. Now here's where you should go, why is it so important to have both acids and base present uh, in a living system? And your answer is pretty much what you would expect. You need to have that level of balance or feedback. The sulfahydro group is SH, it's also called the thiols. Um, they can form covalent bondings and these are hugely important to protein structure. Some of you might realize that there's sulfur in protein. If you've ever smelled burning hair, you know it has a very strong odor, and we know that hair is just a bunch of protein. Our, one of our last groups are phosphates. Organic phosphates are very important. One of the main reasons they're important is they are involved in ATP, which is the currency of energy inside your body. Phosphates have a negative charge, they are highly reactive, and they can release a lot of energy. So you want to make sure you know it's a phosphorus double bonded to an oxygen with additional oxygens. Our last functional group we're looking at is a methyl group. These are methylated compounds, and the reason why I include this is that it's important to your DNA, and it affects the expression of genes. Okay? They also can affect sex hormones and they change the shape of different molecules. Here's what you need to know from this chapter. You need to know isomers and their impacts on life. What happens when you don't have um, the molecule you think you do. Okay, When you have a structural geometric or an entomer. You need to know the functional groups, properties, examples, and names.